Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Introduction to Philosophy again. So, uh, in the previous uh, video, we talked about um, Descartes' view on substance. Uh, so, right now, today, uh, we are going to continue um, this, sec uh, this section on metaphysics by talking about the views of another philosopher, um, Leibniz. Uh, now, Leibniz um, is a German philosopher who lived uh, at roughly around the same time as Descartes. Um, they were both well, actually, he uh, lived a little bit. Uh, um, he lived a little bit later than Descartes, um, but they actually were uh, roughly active di uh, during the. They were both active during the 17th century. Um, now, uh, and this is uh, an important fact to remember because um, Leibniz's view actually um, is very, um, you know, it is very radical um, from by our standards, and uh, it actually is very different from the Newtonian uh, worldview that we are so familiar with. Um, and actually, Leibniz lived at around the same time as Newton too. So it will be um, interesting to understand uh, Leibniz's view by comparing it with um, the, with the Newtonian with Newton's uh, physics. Uh, but but okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So um, before I do that, before we go that far, uh, let me just go through the basics of Leibniz's philosophy first. So uh, Leibniz. Um, so for Leibniz, uh, Leibniz also believes that there is a basic, you know, building block of reality, which is a substance, and this basic substance he calls it, he calls a monad, a monad as in M O N A D. Um, now, a monad, according to Leibniz, is a basic substance, and Leibniz basically defines substance in the same way as Descartes. He defines substance as this thing which so exists as to depend on no other thing for its existence. So, uh, so a monad is a basic substance, and Leibniz also goes on to say that uh, um, a monad is something that is simple and indivisible. Now, um, um, it is very important uh, to keep in mind this word uh, indivisible um, uh, because I'm going to say more about this in a little bit. Um, but in addition to this, uh, Leibniz also believes that um, he also believes in two principles, and these two principles are the first, the identity of indiscernibles, and the principle of sufficient reason. Now, um, uh, the identity of indiscernibles simply says that if two things are exactly identical, if you are unable to find any difference at all between the properties of those two things after the closest examination, then those two things must be one and the same identical thing. Um, why? Well, because, uh, because of the principle of sufficient reason. The principle of sufficient reason says that this is the best of all possible worlds, and so that when God created this world, he has no reason uh, to duplicate things uh, because that will be redundant. Um, so there is no sufficient reason, there is no necessity, there's no reason for uh, two things that are identical to, uh, to exist. Um, so even identical twins are actually um, discernible in some way or other. So because if they weren't discernible, they, you wouldn't have twins, you would have one and the same person. Uh, similarly, uh, if you take say two, you know, two very similar sheets of paper, they are really not identical according to Leibniz. Because uh, uh, because those two uh, papers, if they were identical, then there wouldn't be two pieces of paper. There will be there would be one piece of paper. Um, so the principle of sufficient reason simply, and uh, if you combine the principle of sufficient reason with the identity of indiscernibles, you will get this uh, view that you know there is uh, every single thing that exists in the world is unique and is different from everything else. Now. Um, so let's come back to uh, talking about monads. So if you apply those two principles I just mentioned to monads, then you will uh, then Leibniz will basically say that um, there are you know that every monad is different from every other monad. No two monads are identical because if they were identical, they would be one of the same thing according to the principle of sufficient reason and according to the uh, indiscernible according to the identity of indiscernibles. Now um, so. I have said a lot about you know uh, monads by way of an overview, but uh, let's uh, let's focus more on the idea that a monad is indivisible. What what does it mean for something to be indivisible? Now um, to illustrate, let me just show you something. Um, so this thing here, as you can see, is a Lego brick. Um, imagine for a moment that this Lego brick is a monad, 
I mean, it's not. It, it's not. But imagine that it is. Now, um, so if uh, so, imagine for a moment that this Lego brick uh, is the basic building block of reality. It's a basic substance. Now, um, how? Now, this basic this Lego brick here is obviously divisible. Uh, because why? Because it's physical. You can get something. You can use something to cut this Lego brick into two, and then uh, after you have cut it into two, you can you know cut it into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And even if you cut it down to uh, microscopic uh, uh, bits, you can still, in theory, cut it down to even smaller pieces. Because uh, something uh, something that is very small um, is uh, some real, some physically small thing. Even if it is infinitesimally small, it can always theoretically be cut down to even smaller pieces. So, what that, the moral of the story is that uh, something that is physical, no matter how small, is always divisible. So, what what that means is that in order for something to be indivisible, it must be non-physical. It must be an immaterial substance. It must be something that does not exist in the physical world and does not have physical existence. So let's come back to, to the monad. So um, what that means is that uh, the monad must be something that is non-physical and immaterial because, in a, because otherwise it wouldn't be indivisible. So a monad is something that is, uh, let me repeat this, it is something that is uh, non-physical, is immaterial and has no physical existence. Okay. And and this is where things get really radical uh, with light uh, with light needs because think about this um, if the basic building blocks of reality are immaterial uh, uh, non physical things then no matter how many no matter how many of these building blocks you bring together no matter how many of these um, no matter how many uh, non physical and immaterial phys uh, building blocks you bring together you will never have a physical thing because well, I mean, it's logical that um, you know no amount of no amount of adding up of non-physical things will give you a physical thing. Uh, it just it just it's just not going to happen. So what that means for Leibniz is that since the you know since the most basic building blocks of reality are non-physical, uh, what that what 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 that means is that for Leibniz, uh, in Leibniz's view, the physical world as we know it does not exist. Well, I mean. It doesn't exist in the way that we think that we that we think it does. So what like uh, for Leibniz, what that means is that um, you know there are no there are, there are no physically existing trees and uh, chairs and tables and automobiles. Well, actually, there are no automobiles in um, Leibniz time. So bad example. Um, well, so you know for Leibniz, uh, there are no physically existing uh, chairs and tables and uh, trees and uh, human and animal bodies. Um, so, and this is where things get really, really curious. Um, I mean, so if there are no physical things, uh, if everything is really just non-material and uh, non-physical, then two questions arise. Well, first question is, how do we account for our experience of physical things? I mean, you know, you go about you go about your your everyday life. You seem to we 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 obviously experience chairs and tables and other people as being physical. How do we explain that? How does Leibniz how does Leibniz explain that everyday experience? Um, and the other question is, where do we come in? I mean, uh, if everything is non-physical, then what 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 is this self? What is this mind? Uh, you know, where does it go? Uh, where is it? Um, so, well, um, this is a kind of a big, uh, big questions. So let me try to uh, take this step by step. So according to Leibniz, um, there are basically three kinds of monads uh, in, uh, you know, three kinds of basic substances. So uh, there are perceiving monads, and uh, there are rational monads or souls, and there is a super monad which is God. Um, why do we need God? Well, I'll tell you in a little bit. Okay. Um, so uh, let's use these three things. Um, so 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 if these three things are the basic building blocks of uh, of a reality, then for Leibniz, um, reality consists only of these three kinds of things and nothing else. Uh, everything else is basically you know constructed from these three kinds of things. Um, okay. So according to Leibniz, um, there are as many perceiving monads as there are living things in this world. 
uh, as they are living sentient beings in this world. So for example, suppose I were to look out the window right now and see a bird on a tree. Um, the bird seems to be chirping uh, at me and I am looking at the bird. Um, now, according to Leibniz, um, the bird is actually a perceiving monad because the bird is a, you know, is a being with subjective experience. Um, now, I, I'm also a perceiving monad, but I'm not just a perceiving monad, uh, I'm also a rational monad because in addition to being able to have subjective experience like the bird, I'm also able to have memory, I'm also able to perform certain functions with my mind that birds and bees and uh, dogs and cats can't. So, uh, so all human beings are rational monads. All human beings fall into group two. Now, so what happens is that, um, according to Leibniz, um, you know, when we, when I experience uh, the bird chirping in the tree, uh, I'm actually, it is not actually true that there is actually a physical bird out there that is, uh, you know, you know, that, that is chirping, uh, and uh, and so it is that is not actually true. What's actually happening is that. Um, there is um, the, there there is a sort of uh, very complex coordination going on between uh, what I'm experiencing and what the bird is experiencing, so that uh, the experience uh, the the what the bird is going through, what the what the bird is uh, perceiving is in line, is co is synchronized with what I'm perceiving. I perceive the bird uh, singing, the bird perceives me looking at it singing, and. Imagine if there were a third person, if there was somebody standing outside my window and also looking at a bird, the third person would also see the same thing. He would see the bird singing uh, and he would see me looking at the bird singing. Um, so, uh, so, and the, that, that third person, according to Leibniz, is also a rational monad. Um, so the three of us, me, the third person, and the bird, are actually um, you know, the, the three of us are actually having experiences uh, that are synchronized with each other. Now, why, why and how can our experiences be synchronized with each other? According to Leibniz, um, the, our experiences can be coordinated and synchronized with each other because there is, a, there is something that is doing the synchronizing. Uh, and this something is God or a super monad. So, uh, one way to understand it is that is this. You can think of God as being like a programmer. Uh, he has programmed the world. He has programmed everything. Uh, he has programmed the world and all our perceptions to synchronize with each other since you know since the beginning of time. Um, it is actually not correct to say that he has programmed the world because remember all that exists are monads. So since there is nothing physical, the world as we used to know it does not exist. Uh, since there is nothing physical and things and time can, can only exist because, uh, because there's a separation between physical events, so since there is nothing physical, time as we used to know it does not exist either. Since there is nothing physical and space is basically the distance between physical objects, so if there is nothing physical, that means that space as we used to know it does not exist either. So. So, so we can see why, see why right, uh, Leibniz's um, philosophy is really radical. Because if you, uh, if you understand his philosophy properly, then physical objects don't exist. The world as we used to know it don't, doesn't exist. Time doesn't exist. Space doesn't exist either. All there is is God and, and all his monads, which is all of us. Um, you are a monad. I am a monad. The bird outside is also a monad. So, all we need, all you need to do, all anything needs to do to be a monad is to be an experiencing subject. So there are as many uh, monads uh, right now as there are experiencing subjects around. Um, uh, which is another way of saying that there are as many monads uh, uh, as there are uh, sentient living beings in the world right now. And all these sentient living beings are able to have experiences that coordinate with each other because of the presence and existence of God. So God is like the super monad or like the super programmer, if you have it, if you want to put it that way. Um, so you might, at this point, uh, you might, uh, you might be wondering why, uh, why does Leibniz has to come up with this crazy uh, view that is so, you know, that is so counterintuitive? Why don't we just believe in physical objects like normal people? Well. Um, 
here's one in order to answer this question uh, we should think about how Leibniz view differs from uh, the Newtonian view that we are so used to so according to Newton's physics according to the Newtonian uh, view um, there are uh, you know there are Newton basically assumes that there are physical objects out there he sort of naively assumes that and he assumes that physical objects act on each other which is why we have the law of gravity um, now Leibniz actually is very very critical of Newton's uh, view um, because he believes that Newton's views is problematic because ultimately if you adopt Newton's views you will have difficulty explaining how mental experience is possible I mean think about it this way um, if you ask a Newtonian how can he have access to my mental experience right now the answer is he can't do it it's impossible because you know he could maybe go into my he could open up my eye but all he would see is some tissue he's not going to see the thing that I'm seeing right now um, he could you know open up my brain and try to look in there but all he will see is a bunch of gray matter he's not going to um, see or experience the experiences that I'm having right now so if you start with the assumption as Newton does that there is a physical world and physical objects then you will always have a problem um, of explaining how mental experience is possible you always have the experience uh, sorry you always have the problem of explaining where mental experience um, and, 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 men, and the mind fits into this picture but uh, but if you start from the opposite direction uh, if you start by simply assuming that bodies as we know them if you start by assuming that the physical world as we know them does not exist um, if you only assume that the basic building blocks uh, of reality are, are minds uh, our minds and monads and mental non-physical things then you will be able to actually explain everything um, without having to uh, without having the difficulty of explaining how uh, how mental experience is possible you wouldn't have the problem of experiencing how mind and mental experience is possible and this is precisely what Leibniz you know has accomplished um, and also uh, you know you can also see that like this is also like needs a very unique um, um, way of solving the mind body problem you might remember in my previous uh, video on Descartes that Descartes has this problem of experiencing of, of trying to explain how um, the interaction between mind and body is possible well Leibniz doesn't have this problem because for Leibniz as far as he's concerned the body as we know it just doesn't exist well I mean it doesn't exist in the ordinary you know Newtonian or Descartian sense so so if you get rid of the body in this way uh, if you start with only mind uh, and if you start by assuming that there are minds and other minds and monads that are controlled by God and coordinated by God then the whole mind body problem simply disappears and you will be quite happy so I want to say that it is a very funny accident of history that um, you know that Newtonian physics has now become the uh, predominant uh, worldview in our in our world. Uh, so that you know a lot of people are very familiar with Newton Newtonian physics, but relatively little people are familiar with uh, Leibniz. Well, I suppose this is what a philosophy course is for: is for you know thinking about another, looking at another way of understanding reality that is very different from our predominant way so um, you know it will be it's kind of fun to imagine how different our conception of reality would be how different the world would be if uh, if Leibniz view had become had been the uh, predominant view rather than the present Newtonian view so I'll leave you with these thoughts and um, you know think about this uh, and have fun thank you bye bye